a few little things, just almost more of an exhortation this morning as we launch into the year. I, uh, I would agree with Pastor Brad in the black and white thing. I feel like we are moving into a season of extremes. And I think that the dividing line between those that walk with God and those that don't is going to become more and more and more clear. And we're going to talk just very briefly about this today. And then our guest uh, speaker is coming to give her testimony, which is awesome. And she's, um, for those that don't know Rachel, Rachel is, you've been coming to the church like two years now, ish, yeah, three years, long, longer time. Um, but Rachel, I first met, I think, through Praise 24, and um, we were doing one of the Good Friday services out at the um, Entrex Center, and I had this, like, vision for, uh, we're going to do certain thing with interpretive dance and drama and whatever, extra exceptionally abstract. Just one of those, like, here's the feel, here's the basic building blocks, nothing else. So... When you have something like that, you've got to find the people that also think like that and can fill in the building blocks. And so I remember Rachel was one of the people that I contacted, and she was like, she's an interpretive dancer. She does all kinds of musical things and whatever, and she was super willing to step in. And so she impressed me then. She impressed me more when she was probably, I don't know, 15, 16, and she booked an appointment with me to come and talk about her passion for prayer and how she was getting together with a group of her friends, and they were just praying over the city, and, you know, if I had any counsel for her, any guidance, and I'm like, no other 15-year-old has ever booked an appointment for that, ever. That is shocking. And so that impressed me. And then uh, she's gone through a season in the last little bit that's been very challenging, and watching her walk with God through it um, has impressed me. And this past year, she went to YWAM, uh, left pretty much as soon as you graduated, right? She's valedictorian of her class, and then uh, got on a plane and went to Switzerland. So, you know, that's just, that's just the way people of God operate is the fast and the, like, yes, Lord. And in her journey over there, God ministered to her in a way that um, is transformative, and I think it's going to be very helpful for many of us here. But what she's going to share is her walk with God. And that walk with God is kind of what... Um, there's different ways of phrasing it, but this is what I feel God is speaking for us this year, is this very conscious walk with God. Not walk for God, not walk in front of God, not walk talking about God, but walking with God. And the, the definition of the word with, because what would be a Sunday without a definition? A participant in an action, transaction, or arrangement. It's used as a function word to indicate the object of attention, behavior, or feeling. So walking with God means I am a participant in action with the one who is the object of my attention. Walking with God in that perspective is quite different than, God, this is what I have planned for my day. Would you bless it? This is what I have planned for my month. Would you bless it? This is what we're hoping to do. Would you bless it? It is saying he's the object of my attention. He's the object of my affection, and I am partnering. I am in action, transaction, and arrangement with him. I am doing life with God. And that journey, I think, is going to be the key to us surviving this year, and not just surviving, but actually thriving in it. There's this verse in John 2, 5. We are all familiar with it. It's the story of when Jesus first steps out, and he's going to do his first miracle. And... Uh, it's the turning of the water into wine. And Mary puts a draw on him. She's walking with him. And uh, she's doing life with him. And she obviously sees a need that she knows he can fulfill. But he hasn't done anything miraculous yet. There hasn't been anything come out of his life. And the servants come and she just says to them, whatever he tells you to do, do it. I believe that would be clear instruction for this year. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. I, I, I believe it's going to come into play with finances. I think it's going to come into play with relationships. I think it's housing. I think it's how we do health. I think it's a whole bunch of areas. But whatever he tells you to do, do it. And hearing it from Mary is a very interesting thing because although Jesus had never performed a miracle yet, although he had never done the, the stuff that we get to see on the backside of it, she had experienced God do the impossible before. 
And so when we, we read in Luke 1, 37 to 38, is when Mary has the visitation from the angel and the message from God that God's about to do something impossible. And she says, how can this be? How, how would this even happen? And the answer is simply that. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because I happen to know that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Had anybody else said it, it wouldn't have carried the weight that it carried because Mary said it. Mary had experienced the one who had done the impossible. She was the one who was a walking, talking miracle. She had given birth to the walking, talking miracle. And so from that place of depth, she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She had heard with God, nothing shall be impossible. And her answer to that statement had been, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, whatever it is he tells you to do, do it. She got this message from God. She doesn't know how it's going to happen. The message says, whatever God intends to do, he can do it. Nothing's impossible for him. And she goes, I'm in. How are we facing 2023? Whatever he tells you to do, do it. I'm in. This kind of thing, be it unto me according to your word. It's this interesting thing that Mary hears it, she spreads it on, it, it launches Jesus into his first miracle, and that very same phrase almost, whatever he tells you to do, do it. It's almost the last thing that Jesus prayed while he was on the earth. Not my will, but yours be done. In other words, whatever you want to do, do it. He was walking with the Father like we're meant to walk with the Father. That next level kind of connection. It literally is your word, your way, and my yes. Your word, your way, my yes. As we go into this year, I want to encourage you that whatever has happened behind us, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, uh, a little bit later this morning, but whatever is behind you, I believe it is very important this year, probably more than I've ever felt before, that 2022 stays there. Today is a new day. Today is a new year. Today is a new season. And whatever he tells you to do, do it. Dixon Edward Haas said, the man who doesn't learn to wait on the Lord and have his thoughts molded by him will never possess the steady purpose and calm trust, which is essential to exercise of wise influence upon others in times of crisis or difficulty. If we do not learn to wait on God, if we don't learn to hear his voice, if we don't learn to allow him to mold our thoughts and our plans and our expectations, if we don't have that relationship where we are walking with God, we will never possess the steady purpose and calm trust, which is essential to exercise wise influence upon others in times of crisis or difficulty. If it is a black and white year, if it is a believers and non-believers kind of year, then it is very important that the church is influencing those who are desperate. That it is very important that the light is being shone into the places of darkness. And if we do not know what he is saying and what he is doing, we have nothing to shine. So it is very clear that we pause, that we walk with him. The forward counsel we need is of him. The wisdom, the strength, the courage is of him. It is about walking with him. So I'm going to have Rachel come and uh, you got your mic there. I'm going to pray for her, but I want you to hear her heart. This is a young woman who has experienced much in her young years already. Um, I was just saying this 20, what did you say? 34? Look to Rachel, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an old lady by then. <laughs> She's going to be like doing the thing by then. But um, would you just reach out your hands to her? We want to receive what God's got through her. Lord, we thank you today. For your messenger, we thank you, Lord, for the walk that she has with you. We thank you, Lord, for how she's experiencing your faithfulness and your love and your kindness. And Lord, today, we just thank you for your anointing that rests upon her, your words upon her lip, and the testimony, the offering of praise that she has to bring today. And we just receive it with great gratitude in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, yes, I'm Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can give myself a better introduction than Pastor Charlotte gave me, so thank you. I'm very flattered. <laughs> um, so yeah, today I have a testimony about really just God's love and his healing that he brings through his love um, and how close you can be with God in times when you don't feel close to him. Um, yeah, and if you have ever lost someone or had grief in your life, which is probably most people, um, then you can kind of think back to that time and like relate to me on what you felt um, and then also maybe the healing that you experienced. And if you're walking through that now, um, then I hope that you can also take this as encouragement um, for your future year, that this year would be a year of healing and of closeness with God while you're walking through that. Um, so, three years ago, my dad was diagnosed with colon cancer, and he passed away last year. Um, and it was definitely difficult to watch him suffer and to watch him go through uh, the hardship and to watch him really hold on to his faith, but not to see like the result that we wanted as a healing. Um, and so my family and like a bajillion other people were praying for him for three years. And it was really cool to see the community that we had with all of the prayers. Um, but it also made me start to question like, how many people have to pray for this to happen, <laughs> you know? Like how many more people need to start doing this? Um, and then last year his kidneys failed and I took him to the hospital and we found out that he was going to be probably dead in about a day or two, maybe three. It didn't, there wasn't really an exact time. Um, and it was just me and my dad because my mom and family was in Vancouver. And so I think there was a big moment where I was like, oh, this is actually happening. You know, like we've been praying for healing, but this is real now. It's actually happening. Um, and it was definitely scary. And so I had this moment of like, like, I guess this is it. God is our only hope now. The doctors can't do anything. Um, and so to me, it was like, God heals him really, really quickly or I have to say goodbye, and it was really hard. Um, but my dad ended up living for nine days, and my whole family was able to come and say goodbye to him. Um, and I think throughout the week, my hope started to like climb. So I was like, oh, look at this. <laughs> like Every single day, like I say goodbye to him because it might be the last time I see him, but then every day I get to see him again. And so my hope was building, um, and then he passed away and it just kind of crashed because <laughs> to me it was like okay god like i thought you were prolonging this for a reason you know i like my hope went up and then it just disappointment um and so it was really hard and also he didn't have like this moment when he was dying that he like looked up into the heavens and saw jesus and we could see that that was happening but he just um, was in a lot of pain, discomfort, and um, he was suffering, and then he passed away. And so it was very <laughs> anticlimactic. I was kind of like, God, if he's going to pass away, like at least make it something good, or make it a moment where my family who doesn't believe in God can somehow see your goodness, but nothing. And so I was very, I think, shocked at the ending and the result of like, all of this prayer and all of everything we'd experienced. Um, and for those who have experienced grief, it's really hard to describe and it has a lot of different um, ways that it triggers emotions. And it's not really one emotion at a time. Maybe other people have experienced that way, but I was just kind of like every emotion you could think of all at once, like all the time and then in waves. And so, it was just like pain and a lot of all these feelings that you can't really deal with and it's very overwhelming. Um, but the months afterwards, 
I kind of wanted to hold on to the pain because in a weird way, like, that's what I have of him right now, is this pain. And in a weird way, like, I didn't want to be healed because, like, this pain that I'm feeling shows how much I loved him. And so I just need to somehow deal with it. Um, and I felt very, very let down by God and very disappointed. Um, I also felt like he owed me something. I was like, well, you didn't do that, so what else are you going to do, God? Because you better redeem this, you know, because this sucks. Um, and, yeah, so I started kind of like a pattern of, like, trying to distract myself from my pain and, like, try to soothe myself because it was just very overwhelming. Um, and so I started to, like, distance myself from God because for three years I had, like, cried out to him with everything that I was, and it didn't work, <laughs> you know? And so I was kind of like, well, now I have all this pain, but I can't really bring myself to cry out to you again because it's too painful. Um, and so I definitely pushed him away, um, and by doing that, I also felt a bit of shame because I've been a Christian my whole life, and so you grow up, you grow up hearing, like, just trust God in times of need. And I was kind of thinking, like, it got hard, and I'm not doing so well. So what does that say about me, <laughs> you know? Or, like, I felt a bit like a fraud um, or, like, a counterfeit Christian. Um, and I didn't really know what to do with that. And because of, I was kind of embarrassed that I was dealing, it, dealing with it like this, I didn't really go and ask for help or tell people that I was struggling because people say that like a test of faith will show you what your faith is actually like. And so I was like, oh, I'm failing this one. That's great. Um, and then I graduated in June. And I graduated and turned 18 in the same weekend, actually on the same day, which was kind of fun. Um, and it was actually a really hard month because I was saying goodbye to my childhood, which had my dad in it, and I was supposed to walk into this future without him. And so there was like another level of grief in it. Um, and I also kind of realized like, this is a very bittersweet milestone, and every milestone after this will be. Um, and so it was just like this very daunting idea of like, will there be sweetness in my life? after this? Like, will any accomplishments I do or, like, moments I have, will they be truly sweet ever again? Um, and so that's just how I felt. Um, and this actually was a good thing, even though it was hard, because I came to a point where I just said, mm, I desperately need Jesus. <laughs> like, this sucks with without God, and so it might as well suck with God. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, maybe it'll suck a little bit less, but it's not great without him, so let's give it a try. Um, and I just, I just decided, I came to the point. I was like, I can't do this alone. So, um, good thing, like, in a week, <laughs> I was flying to a DTS with YWAM, <laughs> so it was kind of good timing. Um, and a DTS is a discipleship training school. So it's five months, three months of like lecture phase and like talking about different topics of Christianity and the Bible. And then there's two months of an outreach, like a mission trip. And so I was three months in Switzerland and then two months in Egypt. Um, and it was, it was amazing. <laughs> um, the first night that I got there, there was this community worship night and I just, I still felt like a fraud. I was like, I can't truly worship. I just can't. And I feel bad about it. And so I feel like, should I sing? Like, I've heard Pastor Charlotte say, like, sing yourself into believing it or something. <laughs> but I was like, ah, this is not fun. Because um, I feel like I'm faking it. <laughs> um, but then this one song came on, and it was talking about how... Every time, 
basically they run to God, they're met with love. And all of a sudden, it was like there had developed like a thin layer of ice around my heart, um, just with the disappointment and the feeling let down. And all of a sudden, God just like, crack, and it just came apart. And all of a sudden, like, I could breathe again, and I could worship and sing. And I was like, what the heck? This is awesome. And, and it was so cool because I didn't earn any of it. I didn't have to do anything to get this freedom, or I didn't have to, like, somehow convince myself that God is good for me to then be able to worship. But God did all of that for me <laughs> in a moment. And all of a sudden, I felt his presence, and I felt close to him. I still was grieving a lot, and there were still wounds, but he was there, and I could feel him. And so, I don't know, it just speaks to how God really doesn't expect too much from us. <laughs> like, he knows where we're at, and he is pursuing us way more than we pursue him. And he, like, in a moment was like, you don't have to earn this. I'm going to do it for you. And just gave me freedom. Um, just because of how kind he is, which is amazing. Um, after that, I started going to God with every emotion and all of my thoughts, even if they were, like, kind of angry or something. You know, like, or questions, questioning God. But I was doing it with him. And so I just had to be honest because what's the point in being a relationship with God but you're hiding part of yourself? And he can already see who I am, so what's the point? And so it's more of a gift to him if I can just show him who I am. Um, and a lot of the time when I was just like deeply in pain, I just, I was like, I don't know what to do with this pain, God. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, and he would tell me like, just love again. Like, love is worth this pain. Like, my time with my dad is worth this. And going forward, loving other people and receiving love from people, even if it means pain, is worth it. Um, and so actually, I'm going to read an excerpt from my journal when I was feeling a lot of grief. Um, and maybe you guys can relate to some of the things that I wrote down. Um, but this just kind of shows you like what I was feeling and that you can actually say these things to God and he's not going to be offended. And he's not going to like... <laughs> He can deal with that. He can deal with this. He can deal with your emotions. He's a lot bigger than you are. And so this is what I said. It's been eight months since I've had to start living without my dad. I miss him with all of my heart. Sometimes it doesn't feel real. God, why did he have to die? Why did my beloved dad die when you had the power and desire to heal him? Why did you not prove yourself to my siblings through this great act of love? Like, my heart is broken. What are you going to do about it? How will you redeem this heart in pieces? I needed an act of God desperately. How many times did I cry out to you from the depths of my soul? I cry out and you hear me, so did I not stir your heart? Where was your compassion? Where is my dad? And now with all of this pain, these worries and emotion, I cry out again because I have no other choice. If my God will not act, I have nothing. You were my only hope. Um, and his response was love in every way of the word. And um, like sometimes he would specifically like tell me things about the time with my dad or about um, his passing, but then sometimes he would just I don't know, like wash over me with so much love that all of a sudden I would look at the words that I'd written and not mean them anymore. Um, and part of what he shared with me is that he told me that he shares my broken heart and that he not only like 
cried over my dad, but also over me. And over um, like the loss of innocence that every person goes through in this world. Um, I think he also taught me a lot about what his promises are. Um, and so he told me that everything that my dad wanted and loved is actually fulfilled by him being with God right now. Um, and that my dad is in the presence of the one that he loves. Um, and he's actually in like the full revelation of love itself. Um, and like, yeah, sometimes he would respond and just like pouring out so much love and peace that I didn't know what to do. I was like, okay, well, now I feel better. <laughs> and tomorrow I might not feel better, but then you'll do it again. Um, and so, yeah. Also, something very important that God told me was he said, I never promised you that I'd heal him. And I think that was very important for me to hear because I was holding him to something that he didn't promise me. And so, I don't know if you guys have ever thought God should do something um, that he never really said, and then when he didn't do it, you just wanted to give up on him. But um, in the Bible, you know, he didn't say, I'm going to heal your dad. And he didn't tell me that. He didn't tell my family that. And um, so he wasn't really breaking a promise or he wasn't actually letting me down. Um, but I think if I had heard that without the experience of his love, it would still be one of those things of like, okay, sure, but you could have done it. Um, but because his love was there and he was transforming my heart and slowly like healing the wounds, it meant a lot and it just stuck true to me. Um, and I realized that I had a bit of a, it's funny that you played the video um, with like the vending machine because I realized that I had a bit of like a consumerism Christianity mindset of like, even in the bookstores, when you see all these books, and it's like six steps to get this from God or something, and or six ways and keys to this and that. Like I'm sure some of it is true, but sometimes I think we think we figured him out. Like, okay, I know how to get what I want from God, and that's what a lot of like religions are: is how can we somehow manipulate this higher power to get what we want? Um, and so, I think. I thought of him that way, even though I loved him, I still thought of it that way. Like, my dad put in the work, like he loved you. He read all the books on healing. He had faith, you know, all these things. And so where's the result that I want? And when I don't get that, all of a sudden it's God's fault. Um, but I really realized that like, God has already given me what he has promised to give me. And my hope is not in what God will do for me, but what he has already done. And so it's really not about what he does right now. Like, obviously, it's important what God's doing all the time. But it's not about receiving the help or the result you want right now because God has already fulfilled everything. And he promised us salvation and to be with us. And that's what we can have. Um, so he has um, done what he has said he will do. And then one day I went on a date with God <laughs> in the forest of Switzerland. It was nice. Um, and I came to this like really cool field, this clearing, and there were just these lines of trees, and it was beautiful, and there were leaves, and it, it was just gorgeous. And I was walking through, and all of a sudden I had like a, a picture or a vision, I guess, um, and it was of Aslan. So he's like the, the lion in Narnia who represents Jesus and God. And so he was walking beside me, and I was like, wow, like, I'm in the presence of God. 
And then I look across Aslan, and I see my dad walking on the other side of him. And I realize that as I am in the presence of God, and my dad is in the presence of God, we are walking together towards the same goal. And we're walking um, with the one who, the, who we love um, together. And so it was just like this beautiful moment where I also realized heaven is where God is. And so like right now, I'm getting a glimpse of heaven and being touched by heaven because God is with me. And therefore, so is my dad. Um, so that was just incredibly healing and really beautiful. Um, and then when I was in Egypt, I got to hike Mount Sinai, which was really cool. Um, and it was, it was a big part and like the peak, pun intended, of like my healing journey it was like the mountaintop. Um, because we went up there and we got to read Exodus and worship and watch the sunrise because we climbed it when it was dark. And so we're watching the sun just light up across all of these mountains. And um, I was sitting there and I felt like Jesus was sitting next to me and he was just like, this is who I am. And I really felt, I was like, okay God, if this is who you are, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have my life. This is awesome. Like, you, you are amazing, and you're so much bigger than I could ever imagine, but that makes it so much greater that you love me because of how big you are. It's like, you're so great, and yet you're sewing up my wounds in my heart and holding me. It's, it's amazing. And... Um, and when I was up there and the sun was rising, God brought to mind this song that I super related with um, from The Lion King on Broadway. <laughs> um, I'm a bit of a theater nerd. But there's a song called Endless Night, and Simba's looking into the stars, and he's basically wondering where his father went. Um, and so I'm just going to read you some of the lyrics because I really related with this. And at the end of it, there's like this hope that I felt on the mountain. And so some of the lyrics are, home is an empty dream lost to the night. Father, I feel so alone. You promised you'd be there whenever I needed you. Whenever I call your name, you're not anywhere. I'm trying to hold on, just waiting to hear your voice. One word, just a word will do to end this nightmare. When will the dawning break, O oh, endless night? Sleepless I dream of the day. And then at the end of the song, there's this like chorus that comes in, and they sing, I know that the night must end and that the sun will rise. And this song came to my mind because I'd been feeling like it's just this endless night. I may never have a sweet taste of life after this. It's just this long loss. And I was on the mountain, and the sun was rising. And I finally felt like, OK, the sun is rising on my life. And I feel healed. <laughs> and my grief is still there, but it's completely transformed. And it's a different kind of grief. Um, and it's something that I can feel like the sadness of not having him here, but it doesn't overshadow the fact that God is with him and that I'm with God. Um, yeah. And I think it's also cool because like God, I mean, God, my dad taught me so much about God and he taught me like how to hear God's voice and just like was such a good demonstration of someone who is really pursuing God and who wants to know more all the time. Um, and so even though my dad is not here right now, I am a part of his legacy. And a part of his legacy is 
my love for God and everything that he has taught me. And so God also told me that like everything that I really love about my dad is just a reflection of who God is. And so if you're fatherless, um, like God has the father heart, you know, and right now, like God is my father here and in the future. And I can rely on him. And he told me, he was like, like, I'll take care of you. And I'll bless you. I'll give you gifts, all that stuff. But it doesn't actually matter, the blessings and the gifts. Because now I realize that that's not what I'm looking for. But the goal is to be in the presence of God, to dwell with him from the beginning. So that is the goal. And yeah, that is my story of how I've gone through grief and how God has completely like transformed me with his love and just his kindness and how gentle he is. Um, I want to end with a prayer over you and also a prayer that you can pray if you're in grief or if, you're not in, if your heart is surrounded by ice or if it's hurting, or if it's, you just, you can't see God's goodness, and that's okay because sometimes it's hard to see when you have so many emotions going on. Um, but the first step of my journey was realizing that I can't do it alone and needing God. And so I invite you to want to be healed and to want God to be in it, in the process. And so I'm going to pray, and you can just, like, pray on your own or in your heart or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, if you want to start that journey, then you can pray that over yourself. So, Jesus, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for what you've done in my life. I thank you that you um, hold us and that you cry with us and that... You give us answers and that you um, stitch us back together in a beautiful way. I thank you that um, we are like a pot or like a jar that is broken and that you put together with gold. And so when we are put together, we're even more beautiful and unique than before we were broken. And so I just pray that each person here would be reminded of times when you healed them, when they were fully loved, when they were fully known by you. And I pray that that would encourage them and push them into the next year of receiving even more love. God, I pray for the people whose hearts are a little bit icy, a little bit let down by you, a little bit disappointed. And I just pray that you would be able to be the warm fire that melts the ice and holds them and comfort, comforts them. Um, and Jesus, I just say that we need you and we're ready to let go of some of the pain and to let you take it um and yeah i just thank you so much we need you we love you and we receive your healing and we receive your love and all of the healing and love that you have for us in 2023 um, and any future grief that people go through here, I pray that you, they would be reminded of walking with you and that it sucks just a little less and it's so much better. <laughs> um, thank you so much. We love you. Amen. Told you. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. That's profound. And this is, you know, sometimes you don't need a lecture in theology. You need a lecture in relationship and an experience and real life walking with God. And that truth is everything. And um, the heart of what I feel we need to go into. I'm going to have the worship team actually come. Um, but this, this very thing that Rachel shared today is, it's the fulfillment of um, 
you know, when I say I feel like we need to leave last year behind and move forward, it doesn't mean ignore that it happened. It doesn't mean just box it up and file it. It means actually walk forward with God in whatever it is you're carrying in whatever it is that is there, in acknowledging with him the truth. I love how she said, you know, life's going to suck with him or without him. I'd rather do it with him. Yeah. There's, sometimes there is just reality of like, I'm going to have to feel pain. I'm going to have experiences that I go through. I'm either going to go through them with God or I'm going to sit and just have such resounding whys that I can't get through and I can't hear anymore. And one of the places that I think... Um, we see that a lot is in the story of Elijah. And there's um, 1 Kings 19 is the passage where just after Elijah has had this moment of victory and triumph and fire from heaven has fallen and, you know, all these great power signs of God have happened and he's slain 450 prophets of Baal and you know it's been this big win but it's coming off of a season of hiding and pain and we know that like the fact that um, Elijah even stood up and challenged the king and challenged Baal was because there had been this season of fighting and hiding and isolation and all of this stuff so he comes out and he has a big win and then he He's almost overcome by the fact that um, Jezebel threatens his life and challenges him. And we see him and he, he falls into this place and he's, he's just in despair. And um, the angel of the Lord shows up before him and just says, you know, you just need a rest. And there are times where we do need to rest and there's times where we do need to allow the Lord to minister to stuff. But there also comes a time when that time ends. Um, there was a time of napping and eating, and there was a time of 40 days where he spent just in quiet and in solitude. And then in 1 Kings 19, we see God say, okay, like that's enough now. And he says in verse 11, go out and stand on the mountain of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. In fact, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back to nine. He went into a cave, spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's a good one, huh? What are you doing here, Elijah? I love, you know, um, I, I actually think the first step for Rachel was actually going to YWAM. To go on the mission field when you're a little cheesed at God. It's a good move right that's a good move actually saying i'm gonna i'm gonna go where i know he wants me even though i'm a little upset god says what are you doing here elijah and he says i have been so zealous for the lord of hosts for the children of israel have forsaken your covenant tore down your altars killed your prophets with sword and i alone am left and they seek to take my life i have done all the right stuff i have said all the right things i have been faithful and now this, this is, this is what I'm facing. Then he says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After that earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went outside and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He goes on again and he has this conversation with God and God begins to answer some of the questions. He says, this is where I am and this is what I've done and this is what's going on. And God's like, actually, that's not true. What you're seeing is your own pain. What you're seeing is your own fatigue. What you're seeing is where the enemy has twisted the lies against you, but you're not alone. I got you. And he says, I've actually reserved for myself some people. There's some people that are tucked away. They've been waiting for this moment and we've got some stuff to do. And I love that that particular passage specifically talks about the wind and the mountain and the fire, you know, the, the earthquake. 
and the fire. And we know that it says that, he, you know, God's talking to him in a still small voice, but he talked to other people in all those other things at different times, right? The great strong wind, in Job, it talks about God coming and speaking out of the whirlwind. And he actually breathed these words on, on Job and he's like, this is the truth. We know that there was an earthquake when God descended on Mount Sinai and it says that the earth shook and the people were afraid. God spoke out of the mountain and his voice actually shook the earth. We know that there was fire that God spoke. We know the burning bush, when Moses turned aside, he saw the fire that God actually out of the fire spoke. So there were times when that's how he spoke. But in this moment, in this place of brokenness, in this place of stress, in this place of the end of myself, God spoke in that still small voice. My challenge to us as we go into this year is whatever it takes, maybe it's gonna be the still small voice. Maybe it's gonna be in some big thing. Maybe it's gonna be in scripture. Maybe it's gonna be in something that somebody shares with you. However it is, what we need to hunt for is that voice of God. We need to not be satisfied until we hear the voice of God. And it means that we have to be real. It means that when, when God says, what are you doing here? We answer and we say, I'm excited, I'm delighted, I'm upset, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm frustrated, I'm grieving, I'm whatever the thing is, but I'm in it with you. And I need to hear your voice. John 10, 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I want you to see the three things that happen there. My sheep hear my voice. We have to hear his voice. If it's been so long since you've heard his voice, it is entirely possible that you've allowed something to crust over your heart so that you can't hear him right now. The challenge would be exactly what Rachel just shared and prayed, that we come before him with honesty. When God says, what are you doing here? We answer him. And then we listen, we engage with him. He says, my sheep hear my voice, number one. And number two, I know them. In other words, the relationship commences. We say what we need to say. We hear what he needs to say. We begin to engage back and forth a little bit and we hear what the truth really is. We hear what love sounds like. We hear the hope that goes before us. We know that we don't wanna face a single day without him because we allow him into that space. And number three, then it says, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. In other words, the instructions that you're requiring right now, you're coming into this year and you're like, I don't know what I want, but I, I think I wanna go here and I wanna do this and I've got this resolution and I've got this plan. No, when we hear his voice and we know him and the relationship is healthy, we follow him and whatever he tells you to do, do it. Some of us this morning, you maybe heard me when I opened up and you know, whatever he tells you to do, do it. I would happily do it if he told me anything. I, I know, I know what that feels like. But that he will tell us what to do when we're in relationship because we're listening for his voice. That's the process, we have to pause. And I just wanna encourage you today, we're gonna to sing as we close one more time, Jesus at the center of it all. And this is not just a nice little song. This is a declaration song. This is a, I'm choosing his way. I am choosing to allow him to engage every part of my life, my, my upset, my anger, the frustration, the grief, the hope, the dreams, the ambitions, the plans, the purpose, all of it, Jesus at the center of it all. And this is why we're gonna pause and not go too far into you know, prophetic things for the year. Do you know if I stood up here and could word for word tell you exactly, week to week, month to month for the next five years, exactly what God was gonna do, but you don't trust him, you don't believe him, you don't trust his character, and your heart is hard towards him, it will be irrelevant. That is no more than getting the cheat sheets to a test for a course you never took. God wants us to walk with him. 
him at the center of it all. So let's stand together today. And that's not a, that's not a smack or anything. That's an invitation. I'm just saying, I believe 2022 needs to stay there. And so for us to be able to run wholeheartedly into 2023, we got to go with him. We got to go open hearted. We got to go with a life that expects God to be all that he says he is and a love that carries us through any circumstance. So God, today, we just thank you that as we embark upon this year, we thank you for the reminder that Rachel shared with us, God, of your faithfulness. And we thank you, Lord, that you already know what's going on in us. You already know what we feel. You already know what, what struggles have been. You already know what hopes we carry. You already know what dreams are there. And God, today we invite you into those places. God, I pray that the conversation would be richer than it's ever been. That conversation with you of experiencing you, of hearing your voice. Lord, of feeling your counsel and your guidance and your wisdom and everything. Lord, I pray for every person that has had a dull spot, God, where the, the relationship with you has felt dry, it's felt dull, it's felt like, like nothing's really been going on there. God, I pray that you would come in and God, whether it's the wind, whether it's the earthquake, whether it's the fire, whether it's the still small voice, God, would you speak to us? We lean in and we listen for your voice. And God, we determine that in that voice, we choose the relationship. We allow you to know us completely, God. And we want to know you more. And Lord, we want to be the kind of people that quickly then follow you, follow your lead, live the adventure with the King of glory. We thank you for your kingdom come and your will done in our lives as it is in heaven. And we give you the praise for that today in Jesus' name.